Summer is nearly here, and there is already warning of a mega drought throughout the western United States. One farmer explains what he has to face with lack of water. One of the worst droughts in a millennium is bringing consequences to California across the board, from water restrictions to inflation and fire. A fourth-generation farmer in the city of Hollister spoke about how the drought is directly affecting him, taking away his most reliable source of water. It's limiting the amount of ground that we can farm. It's, the amount, it's limiting the amount of the intensity that we can farm. More than 90% of the western U.S. is now in drought. Scientists say this is the worst dry spell in the region in 1,200 years. And farmers like Bianchi are feeling the strain already. He is now resorting to pumping water from the ground to nourish his fields. Are we going to have water in two, three years out of, the, out of our aquifer? Nobody could say that. But the pumped water is considered lower quality compared to usual sources. And on top of that, the less water, the less crops Bianchi can grow. He says that reduces consumers' choices at the grocery store. And according to economists, less supply pushes prices even higher. That's in addition to sky-high inflation. It's scary to think that we may not be able to do this because we don't have the water to do it. The drought is leaving many fields fallow. In March, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation and a number of California water agencies signed an agreement to pay farmers to fallow their land. And fallow fields can ultimately lead to fire. Despite having the most gun laws in the nation, state lawmakers are fast-tracking a total of six more gun-related bills through legislation. The bills come in response to several shootings in the United States. Let's take a look at what they're proposing. The California Senate Appropriations Committee passed a package of gun control bills on June 13th. Several of the bills were proposed or fast-tracked in response to the recent mass shooting incidents in Buffalo, New York, Uvalde, Texas, and Laguna Woods, California. The assembly bills would add red tape to dealers and manufacturers, as well as limiting people convicted of certain crimes from owning firearms. The bills passed the committee with minimal public feedback. Assemblyman Steve Bennett of Ventura presented a number of the bills on behalf of their authors. AB 228 would require the Department of Justice to inspect firearm dealers at least every three years to ensure compliance with firearm law. AB 228, authored by Assemblymember Freddie Rodriguez, would establish mandatory firearm inspections. Current laws authorize inspections but do not require them. Bennett also presented his own AB 1769. AB 1769 seeks to prohibit the sale of firearms, firearm precursor, precursor parts, or ammunition at the Ventura County Fairgrounds. Um, I think the recent events in Buffalo and Texas remind us of how important it is to do what we can to end the proliferation of guns. The Ventura Fairgrounds hosts the Crossroads of the West Gun Shows Ventura. It's one of the largest firearm trade shows in the area. The gun show has faced local opposition in the past after a 2018 shooting at the Borderline Bar and Grill. However, the NRA Institute of Legislative Action released a statement saying Bennett's bill imposes a one-size-fits-all restriction to prevent officials from deciding how to use venues. Bennett also presented Assemblymember Buffy Wicks AB 2156. The bill would prohibit any person, regardless of federal licensure, from manufacturing firearms without being licensed by the state. AB 2156 would promote public safety by closing the gaps in California's firearm manufacturing licensing law by generally requiring a state-issued manufacturer license to assemble or manufacture more than three guns per year by default. Her bill includes 3D printed firearms. The NRA ILA also pushed back against Buffy Wick's bill, saying this arbitrary ban on 3D printing only harasses law-abiding hobbyists who wish to explore this new emerging manufacturing process. Assemblyman Kevin McCarty presented the remaining gun bills on behalf of their authors. First was Assemblymember Brian Mainsheim's AB 2239. There are... Um 70,000 people that attend gun shows every year. The majority of them uh, follow the rules, but unfortunately too many do not. Recently our Attorney General uh, found that an uh, armed or prohibited person purchased a AR-15 style ghost gun ammunition despite being on the prohibited list. 
Under current gun laws, a convicted felon is barred from possessing firearms. Mainsheim's bill would expand the list of convictions that prompt a 10-year ban. McCarty finally introduced his two bills, AB 2551 and AB 2552. AB 2551 requires the DOJ to notify local law enforcement of attempted firearm and ammunition purchases by prohibited persons. AB 2552 reinforces thorough background checks at gun shows in California. Uh, this would add a list of misdemeanors and crimes that prompt a 10-year ban from owning or possessing firearms. Uh, specifically, this has the support from our district attorneys and focuses on child endangerment and elder abuse to the list of crimes that warrant a 10-year ban. However, the NRA ILA argued AB 2552 continues to cut off access to law-abiding individuals who are looking to acquire firearm parts in accordance with existing law. Most of these bills passed in a 7-0 vote, with AB 2552 passing 5-1. They now await a hearing date on the Senate floor. Authorities have recovered over $200,000 worth of Lululemon merchandise in Orange County. The athletic apparel company says it's the largest recovery of stolen items in the company's history. The California Highway Patrol Organized Retail Crime Task Force intercepted a shipment of stolen Lululemon products from Ohio to an apartment complex in the city of La Habra. The investigators delivered the three boxes to the apartment and noticed several other similar boxes. They obtained a search warrant and recovered 16 boxes full of Lululemon leggings. They seized over 1,800 stolen items worth over $200,000. According to the CHP, their merchandise was stolen at various Lululemon locations throughout the country to include stores in Ohio, Illinois, and Wisconsin. Lululemon representatives said this is the largest recovery of stolen items in the company's history. The apartment residents claimed they did not know what the boxes contained. The investigation is ongoing. Raging wildfires are part of a life for many of us here in California. And now, even before a blaze erupts, one power company says that they may have to shut the power off to keep everybody safe. NTD's Jackie Reels has more. We all take electricity for granted. The food in our freezer stays frozen, the light turns on in an instant, and for many of us, electricity even powers our cars. So why is Southern California Edison turning off the power voluntarily? We talk with one Edison official to find out the answer. Keeping the power up is not always as easy as one may think. Power suppliers have to face a wide range of weather and disasters in California, from extreme Santa Ana winds to earthquakes and wildfires. A representative talks about what leads to these public safety power shutoffs, or PSPS. Leading into a PSPS event, that is based on the weather forecast as well as our meteorologists and our weather stations and our people on the ground surveying what the ground conditions are and the winds. Southern California Edison, or SCE, will initiate a power shutoff in a designated area to prevent the electrical system from becoming the source of the fire. A PSPS is not to be confused with a blackout. We have meteorologists working for us who use sophisticated weather data and models in order to forecast expected conditions. But in addition, we also have people in the field monitoring and verifying real-time conditions. In addition to the meteorologists and the people on the field, we also have up to 1,500 weather stations. Castro said if there's a fire risk in the area and there's enough concern, then SCE would initiate a public safety shutoff in order to keep the community safe. Power lines from state electricity suppliers have sparked wildfires in the past. Trimming back the vegetation around our infrastructure also helps mitigate against these risks because it removes the dry brush around the lines, eliminating the fuel source that any potential sparks would need to come in contact with to cause an ignition. Another safety measure has been to install cover conductors. Covered conductor is highly effective against wind-driven hazards such as contact from objects. It is less effective against fall-ins, which is larger risk in forested areas. 
So covered conductor reduces the risk of debris causing sparking when coming into contact with our lines by insulating the wiring. One example of that debris is falling tree branches. So far, Southern California Edison has installed over 2,500 miles of covered conductors. Jackie Rios, NTD News, Los Angeles. The San Francisco Zoo rescued three 10-week-old yellow-crowned Amazon parrot chicks from smuggling. They're currently healthy. According to the zoo, the South and Central American birds were confiscated at a point of entry into the U.S. during an attempt to smuggle them in. Illegal smuggling is one of the largest threats to South American birds. The species is popular because they are very smart and can copy what people say. After the chicks were transported to the zoo, they were given a health checkup. Now, at 12 weeks old, they are healthy, playful, and curious. A blood test confirmed that one is female and two are male. The zoo says the birds will not be on exhibit until they have matured. The award-winning documentary Eternal Spring will premiere on June 15th in Hollywood. The animated documentary reviews China's continued repression of freedom of speech, assembly, and belief. Hollywood's Chinese theater will premiere the award-winning Eternal Spring on June 15th. The topical location fits the Chinese subject matter as the story revolves around spiritual believers inside China clearing their faith's name in the face of extreme persecution. The movie is based on a true story from 20 years ago. The Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, launched a persecution campaign against the peaceful meditation group Falun Gong. To counter the state's non-stop TV propaganda at the time, a group of Falun Gong practitioners hijacked a state TV channel to broadcast content vindicating the belief. The 2002 broadcast interruption shocked the world. CNN described it as one of the Falun Gong's most daring to date. In the aftermath, the participants faced severe persecution, and some paid with their lives. To date, the human rights abuses depicted in the film are still taking place in China. Film director Jason Loftus is a Peabody award-winning filmmaker and four-time Canadian Screen Award nominee. The 86-minute film took about six years to finish, during which the CCP constantly harassed him and his family. Loftus will be attending the premiere on Wednesday and answering questions from the audience. The film won the Rogers Audience Award at the Hot Dogs Film Festival last month and two prizes at the Thessaloniki Documentary Festival in March. Tickets and trailers are both available online.